This talk is about an emancipatory teaching practice in a technical course. Uh, and what we've done is we've, we've analyzed a, um, a set of focus groups I interviews in the style of uh, autoethnography. I have been an uh, entering educator for over 25 years, and uh, my perspective has shifted radically from the start of my career uh, to w what I see now and the social forces that are conditioning our thoughts in engineering. And I would say that I am a, a tall, white, older woman from much generational privilege. Um, and I've been an engineering educator for nearly 30 years. And like Linda, my orientation has shifted quite a bit from love of the technical to embracing of the whole. Half Russian, half Ukrainian, half Jewish, half American, who knows what, I'm a combination of a little bit of everything. Never embedded in the previous culture in the former Soviet Union, really not fitting in here in this culture. A physicist in an engineering school, a, a, a woman in the space of, among technocrats, somebody who traveled the journey from quantitative world to qualitative world. The purpose of liberal education, as we understand it, is to achieve freedom from self-imposed constraints, reified social forces and institutions, and conditions of distorted communication. And I, I think that we might agree that um, engineering education has a little bit seem to us as the opposite of this, is that it's actually a process of being practiced in self-imposed constraints, uh, largely constraints of the mind, a uh, mindset of participating in social forces and institutions uh, that are conserved through our teaching of engineering in a particular way. And uh, it subjects the students to distorted communications about themselves and who they are. And this talk is a little... Uh, a bit about how do you step out of that? How do you step in the direction of liberating ourselves from these forces? The three of us used an autoethnographic analysis of transcripts of student focus groups. The students had been in a circuits course for which there was an intervention. So we, we saw the students saying things like the alternative version helps me feel better about myself. It definitely made me feel validated. It's really inclusive and nice language. It kind of makes me feel like connected to the lab, more at ease, very welcoming. Makes you feel like, okay, I can do this. These comments came out of focus groups uh, of students who had worked on alternative versions of the labs. And um, those alternative versions had three primary shifts, aesthetic shifts, epistemic shifts, and linguistic shifts. So in this paper, we unpack a number of these reflections, and what we'd like to do now is state why this is important. I, I myself am a professional engineer, where it says to place service before profit, the honor and standing of the profession before personal advantage, and the public welfare above all other considerations. It really speaks to our need to really understand what that means, and the only way we can do that is if we bring our whole self to the profession of engineering. And I think that that's the thing that we were discovering in this research and also all of us have been discovering for many years as engineering educators. We're gonna share with you part of a review that we received on this paper because it so powerfully illustrates an engineering cultural norm. What you might see in the full review is that this is a, a man without malice, that he is probably a nice man, um, a, probably like one of your colleagues. Um, he views himself as uh, supportive of women. And um, as he makes meaning about his experience, he shares his thoughts and experiences. And we have a rare look at kind of him sort of turning and going, oh, huh, maybe this is not as I thought. and. Um, to be fair to the reviewer, what, what we have here is just a tiny snippet that he has chosen to share with us. You're going to see some strong reactions. And a friend of mine uh, says that often when we withhold information, what we're withholding from one another is love. It's our intent to be loving in 
our own vulnerability as we share our reactions to this review. I remain somewhat conflicted about this paper. I'm still not wholly persuaded by its argument. But the authors' focus groups seem to indicate that they are onto something. So I will recommend publication and presentation to the community of our peers. I approach this paper as a persuadable skeptic. I'm not yet a convert, but I have a better idea where the authors appear to have been going. For the record, at the risk of revealing too much of my identity, I am a white, US-born, male electrical engineer who retired in 2018 after 16 years in industry and 21 in academia, with a five-year transition between the two. In industry, I worked with a number of female engineers and technicians. I had female peers when I was in graduate school. I had female colleagues in academia, and I had female undergrad and grad students in my teaching career. Gender was never an issue. In industry, I worked with at least two gay men and one lesbian. It made no difference because their sexual orientations were unimportant to the job at hand. I even had a former colleague in academia in his 50s who came out as a transgender woman. To me, the gender, race, and sexual orientation of my colleagues were unimportant. But I also was aware that others had different experiences. One female colleague in industry told me once of going with a technical question to see her supervisor in, in his office. When she remarked how cold his office was, he told her, young women always look better in a cold room. And I remember overhearing racist remarks by a former chief engineer of that same company. How is it for you to read that, Genya? You know, right now I'm numb, honestly speaking. I am numb because I was on the other end of this, of almost every thing. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm not a transgender person and I'm not gay, but I am a woman who was persecuted by by being a woman. I was persecuted by being, for being feminine, for being beautiful, for being too much, for having nails that were painted, for having makeup on, for walking on high heels. So, and for being too cold in very cold rooms. And so I was on the other end of this comment and I am numb. He told her young women always look better in a cold room. J just to be explicit, what, Liz, what is that? Well, that her nipples would be erect because she's cold. And that's also an um, indication of attraction or sexual arous arousal. And he enjoys that of, from young women. Whenever this comes up, I have two competing feelings. One is incredible anger. Like who the F, does he think, or does any man think they are that they could objectify me and other women in this way? Um, I have three daughters, and so like there's this part of me that's just, this is not okay. And then the other side of me is heartbroken and sad that we still are doing this. I understand why this is being said, but I can't excuse it yeah. because of the pain that it causes me, because of the con constant kind of thought on the back of my mind. Are they treating me the way they are because I'm a woman? Are they, you know, am I here at this institution because I happen to have a good body? Like, what is my worth? And it causes harm that is it's a trauma with which 
I walk day in and day out. Yeah, I, I think that's for me. That's my primary awareness. Is I can I can really feel a sadness and, and feel it in my body. But I am a, a sexual assault survivor, and um, this really triggers for me just the forever emotional work of moving through the world and and being an object to somebody else, for someone else's personal use, and. Um, against for me this the narrative his narrative of gender was never an issue against this story that he knew about it's very hard for me to reconcile someone having those two pieces of of information with them you know that they they say gender was never an issue and yet they have a colleague who not just the colleague but there's racist remarks for whom it, you know, it's not, it's an, never, maybe never an issue for him, but what is it like for other people? Yeah. Well, and it's a little bit crazy making, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Right? you say, oh, gender's not an issue, and yet this happens. This, yeah. I mean, this is just one little thing, actually. Yes. <laughs> you, all of us, have multiple stories of things like this happening. Yes. Mm hmm and it, and then to have somebody tell us that gender isn't a, was never an issue is, I mean, it makes us question our own sanity. Like, wait, what? What? Really? Yeah, I guess it feels disregarding. Here is someone who was very generous to us in taking the risk of revealing his identity and sharing these experiences with us. I worry in this moment that I, I may be leaving him feeling shamed and that's really not my intent my intent is for us to be vulnerable in return and say this is this is actually how it is for us so he's revealed for him it was never an issue and we are revealing for us it's always an issue it's always been an issue and those two things are happening at the same time that people are walking through the world completely free of of this as being an issue, whether it's gender or race or whatnot, whereas others of us are, are walking through the world constantly having to navigate it. Yeah. And I, I also, I think it's the water of engineering that we swim in, mm -hmm. that we just accept that the prioritization of technical, practical, profit-driven, that we accept that as what it is we're doing and I know I did for a really long time and but it's a process that that I've gone through I mean I really think that I was I think I was competitive with women because I had a feeling there was only room for one of us in the room or at the top or as a leader and I know I did that I participated in gender-oriented discrimination for oh. a long time. Yeah, I like what you're doing, Liz, and just sort of seeing your own participation in the system. And I, I will say for myself, too, as having a male identity, I am a beneficiary of the same system that, that has injured me. I, look, I can look back and see that I, I've not treated other women with the regard I wish I had. I have deep regret about that. <laughs> We experience engineering education, the legacy system, as an inherited system of enculturation that replicates its creator's value, the system, uh, and, and the system of thought. Yep. And uh, what we desire um, is to liberate ourselves from the system. We present in the paper a, a pathway to do that. Um, and this uh, pathway... Uh, it looks simply like this, is just knowing yourself and being yourself, your whole self. S step in the direction of, of yourself. So when I'm looking at know yourself, I'm thinking know yourself, your whole self, means accessing the parts of ourselves that are silenced by the society, that are numbed down by the society. Our feeling is that part that has been suppressed is the caring self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, caring for ourselves and caring for each other. Yes. Yes. 